Everyone, go ahead and get started. Um, please give a warm, ladle welcome to our presenter today, Paula Cohen. She's with Law. Um, I'm sorry, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. She's been working for many years, uh, helping to uh, help uh, victims of domestic violence access the courts. Um, she runs a legal clinic down in Long Beach. Um, and she's going to be talking today about domestic violence restraining orders and other ways that we uh, can know more about helping our clients uh, who are victim of, victims of domestic violence. So, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Matthew and Rachel, for inviting me. Can everybody hear me in the room? And how do I know if everybody online can hear me? John gives me the thumbs up. Okay. All right. So, for those of you in the room, there are some materials outside. For those of you out online, you've got all the materials, hopefully, by email. Um, I'm starting with this slide, which is not in the PowerPoint. Um, you have a PowerPoint that looks like this. This is separate, and if you're here and you picked up handouts outside, it's on my legal aid letterhead. It looks like a chart on the front, and then it has this chart on the back. And I figured this was a good, safe place to start because it gives you the overview of California family law proceedings. Um, across the top are the various remedies that you're available to receive in family court, and then down the left side are the actual actions that you would file. And if you look and see which is the one that has all of the check marks, that's the divorce. So basically the divorce is the granddaddy or the granddam of family law. If you file a divorce, any of these remedies are possible. Yes, you can get restraining orders. Yes, you can resolve all those issues with your kids, custody, visitation, support. You can get spousal support, which other, way, other places is called alimony, but in California it's called spousal support. You can divide your property, determine which kids are yours and which aren't yours, and of course, finally, terminate a marriage. So that's the divorce. Everything is possible in the divorce. Now, if you look at a legal separation, that's everything except this last box, the termination of marriage. I mean, there's a lot of confusion out there about legal separation, especially why would somebody want a legal separation? What happens if you do a legal separation and then you want to be divorced? Like, what's it all about? Um, basically, a legal separation has the exact same process, the exact same paperwork, and the exact same timeline as a divorce. You file the same paperwork, but right on the front on the petition, instead of checking termination of marriage, you check legal separation. Why would somebody want to do that? In our case, most of the times we see it, we see it for two reasons. One is for religious reasons. We have clients who come and either say they're not allowed to be divorced or they're not allowed to request a divorce. We have a number of clients who will come in and say, I could be divorced <coughs> if he wants it, but I'm not allowed to request it. I don't make up the rules, I'm just telling you. Okay. Um, so they might file a legal separation. And the other reason that people come in and say that is because they have hope for the future. So they'll say, um, he was fine before the drugs. If he gets off the drugs, there's hope for the future. But right now, I need something that gives me child support, spousal support, custody of the kids, all those kind of things. Um, one word about pronouns. English is very tricky with pronouns. We're all learning a whole lot about pronouns today. Um, I am going to talk as if she is the victim and he is the perpetrator. I don't hate men. I've been married to one for 30 years. I have two adult sons. I don't hate men. But my personal experience in a domestic violence clinic for 25 years is that most of my clients are female. Not all, but most. And most of the perpetrators are male. Not all, but most. So forgive me, it's just easier in terms of pronouns. She's the victim, he's the perpetrator. Not always, but today, for teaching purposes, she is. Um, so there's one other reason why people might file a legal separation, and that is because you have to live in the state of California for six months, and the county in which you're filing for three months in order to file for divorce. So we do get clients who've just moved here from a county or a state. They haven't been here in quite a amount of time. They can start their case as a legal separation and flip a switch later when they've been here long enough to make it a divorce. That's also what happens in those religious cases where she files for a legal separation. When he files his response, if he actually wants to be divorced, he checks divorce on his response, and the case just got flipped from a legal set to a divorce. Okay, so for divorce in California, all you need is irreconcilable differences. And if one of the parties of the marriage wants to be divorced and the other one doesn't, you have an irreconcilable difference and it becomes a divorce. Okay, 
All right, now let's look at the Domestic Violence Prevention Act. So to file a restraining order, you can do it in the divorce case, or you don't have to have a divorce case. It can be its own standalone case. And if you look at the checkboxes across, you can pretty much do everything. It's a very robust action. You can do all these things except terminate a marriage. Okay? So you might have people who don't want it. They're not married, or they are married, and they don't want a divorce, but they need protection. They're going to file a restraining order. Interesting thing to note about filing a restraining order before or after a divorce. If you file the divorce first, and then you file a restraining order against the same partner, then you're going to have it in the same case number in the same court. One court case. So, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with how the court cases are done now in LA County, but uh, yeah. So, 19 is filed in 2019. If it's filed in Long Beach, it's going to get an LB. If it's a family law divorce case, it's going to get an FL. If it's a restraining order, it's going to get an RO, those kind of things. So if you filed a divorce in Long Beach and you've got a 19 LB FL case, and then you want to file a restraining order, it's going to get put <coughs> inside that case. Same thing's going to happen in a paternity. So after the divorce, the next most powerful, as it were, case in family law is a paternity action. It doesn't look very powerful because it only gets three check boxes on the chart. But basically a paternity action is what you file if you have kids together but you're not married. Okay? So you could never have been married or maybe you're divorced and then you had a kid after you got divorced but you have a kid or several and you're not married and now you want to work out custody visitation and child support, it's going to be called a paternity case or a parentage case. It's called birth. It's actually called a uniform parentage case but it gets generally called paternities. And clients hear the word paternity, they think they have to have a DNA test. You don't have to have a DNA test. You may have to if there's a dispute as to fatherhood, okay? Um, but you don't have to. If mom files and says, hey, we have these kids together and I need help with custody and support, and dad responds and says, yeah, those are my kids, but I want them and I want her to pay support, then you've got a contested paternity action. If you have a divorce or a paternity action first, and then you file a restraining order, the restraining order goes in that case. But if you file a restraining order first, you're going to have two separate case numbers. You're going to have your 19 LBRO for the restraining order, and then you're going to have your 19 LBFL for your family law divorce, or, or a PT for a paternity case. Okay, so it's two different cases, but they get heard by the same judge. As soon as Superior Court realizes there's these different cases going on, they're going to consolidate them, not necessarily consolidate them, but have them heard in the same courtroom. So what happened with one of my clients a couple weeks ago is she was in Pomona and filed a restraining order. She had never been served anything. She didn't know there was a pending family law case. She filed her restraining order, and lo and behold, it got set in Long Beach. She had no idea why. When I looked at the case number, I saw that it had been given a Long Beach paternity case number. So the guy had already filed a paternity case, but not yet been able to get her served. It turns out she was in a domestic violence shelter. He didn't know how to get her served, fair enough. But he had filed a paternity. As soon as she went to court to file that restraining order, the, co the court clerks look up the names of the parties and go, oh, they already have a case in Long Beach. So that restraining order was considered an after-filed restraining order and got put in the paternity case in Long Beach. Okay? A um, couple other points here. An annulment has nothing to do with the duration of marriage. People, the myth out there is, oh, we were only married for two days. You know, we got drunk in Vegas and we got married and two days later I woke up and realized my mistake. We want it to be annulled. Well, maybe. If you were so drunk that you couldn't give um, informed consent, if you were so drunk you didn't realize you were getting married, if there's incapacity or fraud or duress or those kind of things, you're on your road to an annulment kind of case. Um, otherwise, two days, two years, 20 years, it, it, something can be annulled with that mental incapacity, fraud, duress, whatever, but not to do with duration of the marriage. Um, when we often see nullity raised with our clients at legal aid, it's to do with immigration. So guys, gals and guys out there got savvy and realized that if you're married to a US citizen, there are some options available. You can do something called a VAWA, which is if you're a victim of violence, married to a US citizen who didn't petition for you. Um, so let me back up just a second. I'm British. I met my husband in the US. We got married. I got a green card because he petitioned for me, and I became a US citizen, wow, a long time ago. A long time ago. 
um, proud to be a U.S. citizen by choice. Um, but he could have been, God forbid, abusive and said to me, I'm not going to do that unless you do this. Okay? So if you're married to a U.S. citizen and they hold your immigration status over you, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to call the police and you're going to get deported. <coughs> Uh, in worse language than that, but they threaten their, their spouse and they don't do the paperwork for them. So you can do something called a vow of self-petition, which means, hey, I'm married to a U.S. citizen or I'm separated from a U.S. citizen who I'm, to whom I'm married, um, but he never petitioned for me and I suffered domestic violence from him, so now I get to put my own application and file to become a citizen because he should have done it but didn't. I prove that I'm a domestic violence victim and that therefore my status is like part of the power and control issue between us and I get to self-petition and get my own green card and be on the path to citizenship myself. So, going back to nullity of marriage, this comes up in our cases where maybe we file a restraining order and the other side responds not by filing a divorce but a nullity because he knows if he can prove that this marriage was a fraud from the inception, she can't go forward with her vow case. And we see that quite a lot. So when I see a nullity petition, I'm already like my antenna, okay, there's an immigration issue here. Um, the last case I had like that, the parties had a child together, and the court did not want to hear that it was a nullity at all, and he kept telling the guy to stop because you have a child together, which is considered proof that it was a valid marriage. And the thing, one of the things that's interesting about family law is you get to use all kinds of quirky things as evidence. So evidence in that case was love letters that they had from before they were married, correspondence that they had when she lived in Mexico and he was here and he went to visit her and met her family and Valentine's cards and all that kind of stuff becomes evidence that it was a valid relationship, a true marriage, couldn't be annulled because there was no fraud, which is what he was alleging, therefore they were actually married, therefore she could file her immigration papers. That was a big detour, but maybe interesting. Um, this one at the bottom is, what's the metaphor for that? The petition for custody and support is like the lowest on the totem pole in family law. It's very rarely used. We don't generally need it. It's for married people who don't want to be divorced, don't want a legal separation, and just want to resolve custody and support. It just doesn't happen very often like that. But it's out there. It exists. You should know it. Um, any questions before we move on from this chart? Yes? This might be outside the scope, but if a client wanted to get his name off of a birth certificate, how do you start those proceedings? Okay. Oh, uh, we have to repeat the question. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the mic? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what <laughs> If a client wanted to get his name off of a birth certificate, how would he start those proceedings? Okay. So my understanding in California is you can't just decide you're not a parent of a child unless there's somebody else who's ready, willing, and able to step into those shoes. In other words, if a child has two legal parents on a birth certificate, and one of them wants to say, a lot of times we have this conversation where, let's say, the mom will say, I won't ask for child support if you relinquish your parental rights. And then they want to go and file something where they say, hey, he's not dead and then he doesn't have to pay child support and she doesn't have to deal with him for custody and they can go on with their merry lives. The state of California does not let you do that. Don't ask me for a code citation, but I know they don't let you do that. Um, what they want is, if this guy doesn't want to be dad, but there's a stepdad in the picture who does want to be dad, then you go through what you guys are probably more familiar with than me, which is a kind of adoption procedure, where the one guy gets kind of replaced on the birth certificate with the other. But he can't simply just remove his name. So how does dad, for example, get on the birth certificate? So it used to be, and I've been a legal aid 25 years, before 1996, you could put anybody's name on the birth certificate as dad. It's hard to imagine that that was true. But you could write Mickey Mouse, and you could write Pope, and you could write, God forbid, Donald Trump. You could write anything on that birth certificate and say that's dad. And that changed January 1st, 97, when uh, California said, no, we're not doing that anymore. If you're married, we're going to presume that the husband is the dad, even if he isn't. And if you're not married, we're not letting you put anybody's name on the birth certificate as dad unless both parents sign something that we now call a POP, but it's a declaration of paternity. So if you're at the hospital and you're not married and, and baby daddy is there, 
and he signs something that says, yep, we had that kind of relationship, and I believe I'm dad. And she signs something that says, yep, I had a relationship with him, and I don't think anybody else is dad. Then the, both parties sign the pop declaration, and that guy's name gets on the birth certificate. The guy has basically two years to change his mind. Because after two years, and he's held himself out to be dad, you're dad. So the one thing about family law that's interesting here is biology is not destiny. Because you could have husband on the birth certificate, even though everybody knows he's not dad. Because he's married, and he's held himself out to be dad, and the baby now calls him dad, and the kid lives in his house, and two years have passed, and you are dad. Um, so I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but um, I know child support services works with these cases. Um, a lot of times because they find a, a guy and send him child support papers, and then suddenly he wants to say, well, actually, I'm not dad. But if two years has passed and he's held himself out to be dad, like I said, we have interesting pieces of evidence in family law. So in those kind of cases, um, there's actually a slide on it in the PowerPoint called Who's Your Daddy? In those kind of cases, we use things like birth announcements, Facebook posts, um, photographs in the hospital, pop declarations, all those kind of things where somebody's holding themselves out to be dad, holding the baby, announcing to the world he's dad, well, after a certain point, he is dad, biology or otherwise. Yes? A quick question, we deal... <laughs> so when we have clients that we're appointed to in the beginning, we're trying to figure out if they're, if they're a parent, if mm -hmm. they're a, a, a good determined paternity. And they're married to the mother. Yes. Um, but they're like, gee, I don't know if I signed anything. Or, oh, I was out of state when I was working. Does, it, does that mean that regardless of what mother says, the hospital will put the yes. married? Yes. If you're married, the hospital will put husband's name on the birth certificate. And they determine the marriage exists? I think you fill out a form. I think it's so we're just like a registration. You, you know, I guess if you don't declare that you're married, if the hospital doesn't know that you're married. So we would be still relying on the mother to provide that information? Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, thank yeah. You. yeah. All right, John, if you wouldn't mind moving us to the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I get to take over from here, right? Yes. All right, well, we can skip that one. Um, today you're going to learn some basics about restraining orders, family law, and most of all, you're going to know the referral so you can send your clients to us. Um, this we sort of went through on the other slide. The only thing, the only thing I, well, I didn't mention jurisdictional contests, which are really nice, juicy cases in family law. You must deal with jurisdictional issues as well, yeah? So I don't need to tell you about the UCCJEA. <coughs> We see those a lot, especially at legal age with clients who've been transferred from one shelter to another shelter, out of county, out of state, all those issues. Um, I like those issues. If you see them, send them to legal aid. Um, but yeah, those get juicy in terms of how long the parties have been in a given state. Was it more than six months? Was it less? Was it a temporary absence? Um, all those kind of things. And child abduction hate cases, do you guys see those at all? I don't, I don't work with those generally, um, I don't know, I think that's about all I'll say about that. That's, it's a special, it's a you know, discreet specialty that I don't particularly work with. We do see alleged abductions, and we certainly counsel clients on not concealing a child unless they're in a domestic violence shelter and the shelter does the, um, um, what's the form called, the form that they do for the DA. Do you remember, Brianna? What is that form called? Sorry, the form for the DA that they... So when, when clients go into shelter, if they have a child with them, there's a form that the shelter files with the local DA or a police department, which basically tells the police department that this child has not been abducted and that the child is in a confidential location. There's a name for that form, and I'm just forgetting it. But basically, the shelter needs to file it within 30 days. Um, at the, of the family coming into shelter, so that if a parent would go to a police department and say, missing persons report, they're able to cross-check it on a confidential list and show that, oh, those people are not actually missing, they're in a confidential location. So it's a way of, of law enforcement figuring out whether it's an actual child abduction or whether somebody's in hiding <coughs> for safety reasons. Um, we do not assist with adoptions, but you guys see those in children's court? Don't do you don't do them yourselves, okay. Um, we hardly ever do guardianship cases. Um, what we have done in the past is 
like you, help parents to keep their kids. Um, so we have done sort of guardianship defense where a grandparent will file a guardianship, but there's no actual need. Um, we may help a parent to defend against a guardianship, but it's not, we don't do it a lot. I have done it some. We don't do probate, dependency, that's you. And support, we send to child support services or the family law facility. Um, this is in your materials, I'm not going to labor it, but we have three clinics that you can send clients to. Um, clients to. Um, the one in downtown LA and Long Beach, those are on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And then we have one in Santa Monica that's every day but mornings only. But all that's in your materials. And on to restraining orders. Now you guys must see and work with restraining orders. But we work with JB 245, 250 and 255. Okay. And so I'm really anxious to know the difference. Anxious? Oh, I don't want you to be anxious. No, <laughs> I've always wanted to know. Okay, so JV245, is that a form number? Yes. What is that? Form number. Those are the restraining, temporary restraining order, okay. permanent restraining order. When I've dependency. seen them, they look pretty similar to me. I mean, for example, there is a domestic violence restraining order that's for people in a relationship, and we'll get to who gets to file it, and that's called a DV100. But then there's a civil harassment uh, restraining order, and that's called a CH100. And then there's a gun restraining order, and I forget what the letters are, GV maybe, 100. So they're basically all kind of designed to parallel each other and provide the same kind of remedies with slightly different kinds of relationships. So off the top of my head, without knowing too much detail about your juvie restraining orders, as far as I understand it, they work pretty similarly. The forms, the process, pretty similar. Brianna's nodding her head. Brianna in the room was my legal intern, so she knows what I do and she knows what you do. So. <laughs> Um, so emergency protective orders, is that something you guys are familiar with at all? Okay, so those are issued on the scene. Um, if I say by a police officer, I need to correct my language. It's not actually the police officer that's deciding, though it seems to the client that it's being issued by a police officer. So if you call 911 and it's a DV situation and an officer comes, a well-trained field officer might volunteer proactively getting an emergency protective order for a person in need. Um, we do a lot of training with police departments, however, there's many police departments in LA County, um, they don't all volunteer it. But basically what happens is they're at the scene, it's a DV situation, maybe the guy fled, I don't know, but the, the police officer calls an on-call judge. So all of the family law judges in LA County have a couple days, a month, every other month, something like that, where their courtroom is dark and they're on call to everyone in LA County to all these law enforcement agencies. Wow, right? And they spend the whole day answering phone calls. You can imagine in that situation, the police officer is basically your advocate. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do if I'm training, for example, domestic violence shelter staff, or, you know, if they're answering hotline calls, for example, help people to understand that however angry and however upset you are, you want that officer to work kind of as your advocate, so it doesn't help to be incapable of speaking to the officer, to be so upset that you can't explain to the officer what you need, to be rude to the officer, um, all those kind of things. So if you're a person in need with a domestic violence situation, you call 911, the officer's there, and the officer realizes or asks or decides that maybe you need some emergency protection, then the officer would call the on-call on judge and basically give a mini scenario. I'm here at the scene and this is what happened. The judge on the phone listens to the scenario and decides whether or not to grant that emergency order. And then the officers have these notepads in the car. You may have seen pink or yellow. Um, they're in triplicate, they're impossible to read because they're always handwritten and we get the bottom one in the pile. But basically, it's a super fast, issued immediately, and it's good for five to seven days, the earliest of either the fifth court day or the seventh calendar day. So basically, it's a really short fix, but what it does is it really helps the litigant to get the help they need once they get into family court. Because when you, I'll get to you in one second, when you show up, in a, let's say, our domestic violence clinic, and you already have an EPO, we're gonna use that as evidence that something happened. It doesn't prove exactly that what I say happened happened, but it's evidence that A, the police were there, and B, that a judge has already heard some protracted version of the story and decided that the client needs protection. So once, for me, once I see an EPO, that really helps the trajectory of the case. Because once they have an EPO, they're more likely to get this, the temporary restraining order, which is good for up to 21 days, and then that's also going to be evidence for them when they go to the hearing, it's more likely they're going to get the full protection. Should I close that? Yes. Um, which nowadays, a civil restraining, uh, domestic violence restraining order is good for, can be issued for up to five years. 
the criminal ones that can, can be issued for up to 10 years, and the civil ones up to five years. Our anxious audience member <laughs> has a question. A lot of times the judges in our courtrooms, uh, or it's presented by county council, that an emergency protective order was offered to this parent and yet they declined it. So the fact of whether a police officer offers or does not offer an emergency protective order, that's, that doesn't indicate whether or not they believe it's necessary, they believe that it happened. Um, first of all, I would question they declined it. Was it ever explained to them what it was? Or if it was ever actually offered Or to if them. it was ever actually offered. Right. I mean, who knows what actually happened in the crisis at the moment. <clears throat> so then the answer is it's not determinative of anything. Whether, whether it's If whether they it's don't offered. have it. If they don't have it, it's not determinative. If they do have it, then something happened that the police were there. If nothing else, it shows the police were there and a phone call was made. And there was some version of some story that met the basic allegation for a DV protective order. Uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, you're, are you aware that we, on Monday, represent moms and on Tuesday represent dads? Yes. And we go back and forth. And so what I'm most interested in is the kind of question that he just asked, which is what can be inferred from a failure to have an emergency protective order or a refusal by the, or just a failure by the police to give one. And also, in the big picture, what, what, how is domestic violence restraining order different from a civil harassment restraining order? And okay. do we know whether the JV restraining order is closer to a domestic violence or closer to a civil harassment? Okay, well let's, let me see. Let me just see where I want to move myself to here. <laughs> ways of getting protection and, and let me just say if you have the one that has my legal aid letterhead if you have that one that whole handout three pages is telling you the similarities and differences between a civil domestic violence restraining order and a criminal protective order okay it goes through the differences and similarities also between criminal and civil so that's also another distinction because a lot of different kinds of restraining orders. But let's focus on the civil domestic violence re restraining order. You have to have this required relationship. And if you don't, you may be eligible for a civil harassment. So let's talk about what this relationship looks like. And I usually say, well, look at me and I will show you. Okay, so from me, I have to be within two genealogical degrees. So from me, that would be my parent, that's one. My grandparent is two, child is one, grandchild is two, spouse is one, and sibling is two, because it goes up one to my parent and down to my sibling. So it has to be within two genealogical degrees, so that's my little family bubble. And then you also can have anybody who's considered a spouse or former spouse. So if you've been in any kind of dating relationship with somebody, no matter how long ago, you qualify. So it could be that we were high school sweethearts, we didn't see each other for 20 years, and then lo and behold, he found me on Facebook, we started talking, he got the wrong impression, he's harassing me and stalking me and this, that, and the other, but no recent romance, it still counts as a spouse or former spouse. So we've got that dating relationship. We've got these family members. Now there's another category that causes some confusion, which is affinity. So do I have that down here? I don't actually, but it goes down here. So affinity is I get to stand in the shoes of my married spouse. I have to be currently married. So it doesn't matter if I'm divorced, it doesn't count. And it doesn't count if he's my esposo, but we never actually got married. Okay, but if we're actually married, I get to stand in his shoes. So then I can go two degrees from him, as well as my own two degrees. And that's considered affinity. And it gets people very confused. But generally speaking, what we say is you have to either have had a relationship or be in this tight family bubble. And if you start to get to the point where there's lots of apostrophes and hyphens, 
my brother-in-laws, ex-sister-in-laws, boyfriends, girlfriends, you know, when we go down that road, it's probably gone too far. So sometimes we'll get people who come into the clinic and they'll say, I want to file a restraining order against my boyfriend and his new girlfriend, okay, because they're harassing me and they're doing this, that, and the other. Boyfriend, or ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend. Ex-boyfriend, we form a spouse, no problem. His new girlfriend, no relationship. So if our client was filing a restraining order against both of those people, they'd be filing a Domestic Violence Prevention Act civil restraining order against ex-boyfriend, and they'd be filing a civil harassment, if they have grounds, against ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. Does that help? <laughs> well, let's, let's check this out first. What's, what's, what's the burden of proof? So the burden of proof is different. The standard of proof. The standard of proof. So in, in, in domestic violence, it's a preponderance of the evidence. So the way I kind of explain that, I mean, you guys probably know, but it's just tipping the scale that much. So what I often tell clients is the judge has not only to believe you, but has to believe you more than the other side. So if you tell your story and it's nice, credible, sounds good, sounds like you meet the allegations, but then the other side denies it and has their own version of the story that also sounds credible, the judge is stuck because this is credible and this is credible. No restraining order. Preponderance of the evidence means you've got to shift the balance that much. And the civil harassment one is, what's the next? Clear and Thank you. Clear and convincing. So it's harder. Um, I will tell you that family court judges hear both restraining orders and civil harassment and they hate civil harassment, hate with a passion. They don't think it's fair that they should have to listen to them. They don't want to listen to them. They don't want them taking up their time on their calendar. They don't like them. And their inclination generally is to deny them. Um, it's a lot of he put dog poop on my doorstep kind of stuff. Um, I mean, really, I've seen it. Um, and they don't like them. But um, as far as family law litigants are concerned, what we're dealing with at Domestic Violence Clinic is people who generally are a spouse or former spouse. Unfortunately, we get a lot of grandparents with adult grandkids on drugs filing restraining orders. We see a fair number of those. The parents are AWOL, the grandparents raised the child, now they're on drugs and stealing stuff and threatening the grandparent, those kind of things. Um, Roommates, you can't be just roommates. There has to have been some romance or intimacy, some relationship between them. Um, I feel like there was another part to your question that I, sorry, well, that I didn't address. No, um, just to add, so it, the, the requesting party has to prove by a proponent of the evidence that what? Okay. Oh, well, there you go. That's the answer to your other one. Um, wait, what order do I have this? <laughs> Well, let's go back to abuse need not be physical. We are not going in order at all. Abuse need not be physical. So, yes. Got yes. I got it. You got it. Okay. So, I did give you on the domestic violence restraining order nuts and bolts. I didn't put that on up on the screen. But I put as many code citations as whenever I remembered it so that you have the definition of abuse and all of that. But the most important thing is it need not be physical. So the assumption everybody makes is we're dealing with physical violence. And if there is physical violence, that's the most visceral and easiest for the judges to kind of hook their hats onto. So any kind of photographs uh, of injuries, anything like that, the physical abuse is going to tell the story the best. But it need not be physical, and there's a series of cases more since I've done this PowerPoint. Um, so this first one was interesting, where he basically refused to accept the end of the relationship. So if one person thinks there's still an intimate relationship and the other one doesn't, it's kind of like what we talked about with irreconcilable differences in divorce. We've got a problem, and that guy won't leave her alone. Then, in fact, in that case, I think it was the other way around. That gal wouldn't leave him alone. <laughs> um, so we can use that. And then Ned Carney talks about all the internet stuff, internet hacking. Um, in Ned Carney, the fact pattern in that case was the guy knew the password to her account and was actually reading the emails between her and her attorney and made the very foolish mistake of filing one of them as evidence in his case. <laughs> okay. And then harassing phone calls, all those kind of things. So it need not be physical. It can be anything that could constitute um, a credible threat of imminent harm. So any kind of, so I use as an example, it's not just, bitch, I'm going to kill you. It's, bitch, I'm going to be there at the end of the day when you get out of work. 
kill you. Like it has to be specific because unfortunately people say all kinds of horrible things. I see you, I will get to you. People say all kinds of horrible things to each other that are horrendous but don't actually rise to the level of, of getting a restraining order. And just a generic kind of I'm going to kill you, unfortunately people do say those things to each other and it's not enough on its own. But if it's got some substance to it, if there's some history to it, if there's a worst case physical abuse that happened 10 years ago and now he's back and threatening things, we can use what happened 10 years ago, we can use today's credible threat. And then the other thing that's kind of more amorphous and um, harder to work with is the general disturbing my peace. So it is part of the code, I do have it in abuse defined on the nuts and bolts. It's uh, Family Court 6203. It, it goes through the list. So it's got actual physical abuse, you've got sexual assault, you've got a person in reasonable apprehension of imminent serious bodily injury, that's the credible threat, um, and then you've got disturbing the peace. So those are the hardest cases to make and the cases where the judge is kind of like, hmm, don't know if that meets the allegation, the requirements. Um, <coughs> but it depends in what ways that person is disturbing your peace and how many ways you can describe that person is disturbing your peace. Okay, where are we on here? Um, who can be protected? So it does say on the form, it asks you, I, I will get to you, it asks you if you want to protect just yourself or do you want other people as well? And it actually says on the form, other household and family members. That's unfortunate because litigants who are filling out the paperwork themselves decide that what it means is they can list all of their other household and family members and I've seen it like handwritten in all the margins, every cousin and relative and household member and they just think they can throw in everything which is unfortunate because the judges just get annoyed with that. Um, but basically the way I describe it is our job as advocates is to help our clients to get the broadest possible protection and the judge's job legitimately is to grant the narrowest order that's still going to protect, grant the protection necessary. So our job is to be able to explain to the judge why we need to include certain other people in the protective order and the judge is going to say, well, I don't know, that person can file their own, this person no. So generally speaking, if you've got another adult who can file their own restraining order, the judges are going to want them to do that themselves. But if you say, I have an elderly mother, she's housebound, he's threatened to burn the house down, I have a case right now where my party, my client, uh, both parties live in Catalina um, and so they're in very close uh, proximity to each other kind of all the time and he threatened to burn her grandparents house down which is where she lives. I actually have it in the text which is beautiful, it makes me really happy. Um, <laughs> um, but that's an example where we could get protection for the grandparents as well. I'm sorry, I was late asking about your question. I want to go back to the hypothetical regarding the EPO instance where yes. police officers respond to an alleged domestic violence incident. Is a police officer calling the, the on-call judge even if you don't ask for it? So it's very, very variable depending on the police department. So they can they call can. without you asking? Yes, they can. Okay. They can decide that you need protection. Um, and I, I've rarely heard somebody say, oh, well, they, I offered it, but they denied it. I mean, maybe those are not the clients I'm meeting, so I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but the way I usually hear it is, you know, they tell me the police were there, I'm like, well, did they offer you an emergency protective order? What? Never heard of it? Don't know. I mean, it's possible the officer did, but they were in such chaos and, you know, confusion that it went over their head. Who knows exactly what happened in that moment? Um, but yes, the police officer can, can voluntarily call. Moving on, um, minors 12 years and older can file their own, they don't need permission. Um, under 12 you need a guardian ad litem and that gets into really sticky stuff because the courts, the family courts, do not want a child filing for a restraining order against their parent. They just hate that. They just hate, hate, hate that. And if there's any way to put it in a family law case instead, they will. So I had a 16 year old who came to the clinic and wanted a restraining order against his dad. We filed it, it was denied, and the court said these parents were divorced 10 years ago. There's a, there's a divorce case out there. If he doesn't want to see his dad, then there needs to be some kind of adjustment for custody. We're not hearing it in a restraining order. Yes, in the back room, do you have a microphone? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. If the child is in, if the child is in the restraining order, 
Um, what effect does that have on subsequent family law orders? For instance, I have a client who, um, the, the child's in the restraining order, mm -hmm. and the client moved out of town, and in, in my client's mind, it was the, the requirement for notice was no longer in effect because um, you know, none of the visitation counted because there's a restraining order now. Mm -hmm. And um, she indicates that the judge told her <clears throat> the restraining order supersedes any of the visitation orders, which is true. Yes. But she also took that to mean the notice requirement for her to change um, you know, the state where she lived in. Okay. So the most recent order is going to be the current order. So if the most recent order is the restraining order, so let's say the parties are divorced, they have a custody order, they alternate, I don't know, every other weekend and exchange at the front of her house, whatever, that's the current order. Then something goes wrong at one of the exchanges. Let's say she has grounds and she files and gets a restraining order. The judge is going to know about the prior order. And that's something I assume is on your JV form, but it's on the DV form. They want to know any other case that's relevant anywhere that there's any custody orders, it's very important that you list that because the judges will be furious if you have new information that you didn't provide. But the court is going to know. And going back to what we said at the very beginning, if the divorce was filed first, the restraining order is going to be in the divorce. So we're going to be dealing with a judge who knows what the current orders are, they're listening to the allegations about the restraining order, and now they're making a new custody and visitation order. There had to have been notice provided, and then that's now going to be the new order. Okay. So okay. she's still required to give notice. Always required to give notice. To yes, always required to give notice. So the new order might be sold to mom and nothing to dad. She still can't just disappear. Right. Okay, dad still has rights to all the school information, all the medical information. Oh, even if he's restrained from seeing yeah. the child. Yeah, yeah. And most restraining orders where they have kids together, the judges will check the exception box. So the exception box says he has to stay 100 yards away from her, he can't contact her, can't stalk, can follow her, and all those kind of things, except for peaceful communication to do with the children. So generally speaking, when they have children together, the judge is going to check that box, unless it's really awful right. stuff. It's, yeah, it's a paternity action. Okay. They weren't married, but the, the reason for the restraining order was that he, he did identity theft using the child to get credit cards. Okay. So, but still, the net doesn't affect the notice. Not the at all, no. I mean, you're requ anytime you want to do a modification, you have to do notice. Mm -hmm. If it's post-judgment, it has to be personal service, unless there's like a special form if you can show that you checked out where he lived and you proved it within 30 days and you sent it, whatever. But generally, it has to be personal service. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I flipped through a whole lot of slides. Yes. When the judge grants a family law restraining order, you need a microphone. And there's when the family court grants a restraining order, and there's kids listed in the restraining order, I oftentimes see that there's a no visitation for the temporary restraining order, and then they get here, and then we have to file a whole set new paperwork to modify that. If do the judges even look at the visitation, or do you just stamp on them? So on the temporary restraining orders, if they have kids together, we go ahead and request emergency sole custody to our party, so let's say mom, with no visits to him pending a hearing. And there's generally two outcomes to that. One is the court just grants it, but it's only for three weeks and it's going to get modified. And the other that we see most of the time is that the courts have a little stamp that says may be issued after hearing. So most of the cases we file where the parties have children together and we're asking for custody and visitation orders, what we get back is a restraining order that says on the TRO, um, partly granted and partly denied. And the part that's granted is the protection for the adult, and the part that's denied is any request for custody and visitation, because the court doesn't want to make those orders until they've had a proper noticed hearing. So at that point, so maybe I should step back and say, when our clients come in and they're filing for a temporary restraining order, we use a standard form where they don't provide notice. So the standard form says, I'm too afraid to tell him that I'm filing, so I'm not telling him. So I could literally go to court today and file a restraining order against my husband with no grounds, with a whole bunch of bogus stuff, and get a temporary restraining order without him knowing. It would be a terrible thing to do, but I'd have to get him served before the hearing. So somebody would personally serve him, there would be a hearing in 20, within 21 days, and at that point, the judge would get to hear from both sides. 
Um, so I keep hearing, I think it's my phone. I thought it was off, but I keep hearing it ping. Okay. Um, so at that point, it would be a no notice hearing. So yes, you will see some temporary restraining orders that say custody to the protected party and no visitation, but it's not going to stay that way. In almost 99 cases out of 100, it's not going to stay that way. The judges are required to make orders. The, the code says that the court has to make orders to allow for frequent and continuous contact with a non-custodial parent. So even if the court is giving custody to our victim, in our case, let's say mom, then dad's still gonna get ongoing visits with the child. Um, this is something that's sort of related to the previous question, but it comes up a lot in family law litigation. Um, we call it the 3044 rebuttable presumption. And basically what it says is, if a restraining order has been issued, the presumption is that the children should reside primarily with the nonviolent parent. So the court, generally speaking, is going to give custody to the nonviolent parent and then has to make some very specific parameters about visitation for the violent parent or the perpetrator. So the specifics are, it can't just be reasonable, it has to say the date, the time, the location for the exchange, so that it's enforceable by a police officer. Yes? Just, just to everybody, want everyone to be reminded that that does not apply in dependency court under NACM. And that was last year? No, this year. This year. Ooh, like yeah. Matthews. Um, that doesn't mean that CLC or the other parent might not argue it, but it does not, they can't say under 3044, I am ordering. Thank you. Um, and then we get to all kinds of litigation about what it means to rebut that presumption. So I have a case right now where we did get a restraining order, mom has sole legal and physical custody, dad has supervised visits by a family member, and he has been kind of a repeated it's like a serial filer trying to get this presumption of a term, but he hasn't done any of these things. And the judge keeps telling him, like, go away and do your classes and come back later, and then he files again. <laughs> We're kind of stuck in this circle. Um, but they have to do some of this stuff. So in my case, the guy came back and he said he did do parenting, and he produced a certificate from an online parenting class that was four hours long. And the judge said, no, thank you. And then he said he did do batteries treatment program, and it was the same online program, four hours, $25, get your certificate, move on. Judge said, no, thank you. So um, we do use this rebuttable presumption a lot. It's very helpful for our clients. I imagine, um, well, you don't have to deal with it. So moving on. Um, I skipped through all kinds of slides, so let's see what... Do you want to talk about the process of getting a restraining order, or is that something you're kind of familiar with? Could, could you tell us in restraining orders where the judge has chosen not to grant the restraining order? Could yes. you give us a couple of scenarios about what the facts were that courts found persuasive, and if you know any case, all that would be awesome. I, okay. Well, I heard one yesterday um, where... Actually, our attorney was kind of outraged that the client didn't get a restraining order, but what happened was, on the DV100, you have to list if you have children together. Even if you're not asking for custody and visitation orders, there's a question that says, do you have a child together? Mm -hmm. And the client left it blank and they had a child together. And even though there were substantial allegations and even photographs of some of the abuse, the judge was so furious that the client had lied, misled the court, the judge said, I find you not credible, and denied the restraining order. Um, when she came to the clinic, our attorney was furious that it had been denied, and I was like, well, it's kind of legit, actually. I mean, that's pretty... There was a whole discussion in the courtroom where the judge said, like, did you forget that you had a child with him? Um, it was denied. Um, the main reason we see it denied is, is this preponderance of the evidence. She's credible, he's credible, I don't know. I don't know. Not convinced. Um, so, in the old days, so I've been at Legal Aid for 25 years, I used to get excited if a client came in with a handwritten scrappy note that he left on her car with some kind of nasty threat. Coming for you after work, page, you know, one of those. And I'd be like, yes, we have evidence, hooray. We blow it up big, exhibit A, we have our evidence. We put in a Valentine's card to show it's the same handwriting and, you know, we've got evidence. Today, Every restraining order we file has a printout, a screenshot from something. 
Mm. It'll be a text message or an email or a Facebook post or an Instagram or something. Um, I had one where I had a client who had a restraining order that was going to expire on a certain date, and the guy made a Facebook post that said, can't wait until, and that was the date. <laughs> You know, so but text messages and these, you know, you're representing both parents. These run back and forth, from worse to to worser. You know, from bad to worse. I mean, they're just horrendous. And most of the time, when we have clients come in and they say, "Oh, he threatened me, threatened me. Look, 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 look what he said." And I say to them, "Do you mind if I scroll up and down?" <laughs> and guess what I find? You know, and if I find that her threats to him are as bad or worse as his threats to her, well, like we're not following that. We're not filing that. Um, so you've got to be willing if you want to show something, you know, here on the phone. And it's not uncommon, I don't know if you see this in Juvie, but it's not uncommon to have a judge on a bench sitting looking at both phones, scrolling through to see who deleted what and what they really said. Um, yeah, that stuff's coming in. Um, so what helps you to get it? It's evidence, specific evidence that shows a specific threat, photographs, police reports, medical reports, um, all that stuff helps. Um, and what hurts, all the stuff that my client said that she shouldn't have said, um, that's equally as bad to the other side. Was there a question at the back? No, okay. Um, so in terms of the process of getting a restraining order, there is a handout that, I, I don't have a copy of it, but I think I put this one. So let me just hold this one up, and it was in the materials as well. This has Long Beach specific room numbers on it, um, but what it says is how to apply for a domestic violence restraining order. We also do have it in Spanish if it's something you guys might want to have, um, but basically it's, it's our version of our 12-step program. Everything on side one, one to six, is how to get a temporary restraining order, and everything on side two, seven to 12, is how to get an order after hearing. And it goes through it step by step. So it's kind of the same everywhere, just ignore the room numbers if you're not in Long Beach Court, because we use this in our clinic. Um, but it goes through what you have to do. And there's kind of a myth out there in the general public that if there was, you know, the police came out last night, they took a report and they say to the woman, you should go to the courthouse and get a restraining order. And she shows up and thinks she's in a bakery um, and that she can just go to the window and say, like, I'm here for my restraining order. They literally think, like, that's it, they got it. And they're astonished to find out that it's this long process. So, um, so it's a 12-step process. The first six steps will get her... Um, 21 days of protection and after that she's entitled if she proves her case and if the judge finds her credible to get a, a civil order that's up to five years but I will say the majority of judges have been on the bench long enough that they remember when the maximum was three years and they're sticking with the three years we don't see too many of the five-year ones um, in criminal court you can get up to ten years um, if they have a criminal protective order yeah we're gonna put that in in the civil case and you know that we're going to get our civil restraining order because, you know, the threshold is lower. Um, but generally speaking, we're going to see, in most cases, when we see the restraining order granted, we're going to see a three-year order. Um, if they have kids together, they're going to make some very specific custody and visitation orders, and they're even going to send the parties to mediation, even though we've got an imbalance of power in the relationship. Mediation is mandatory in family law now. It used to be voluntary. Now it's mandatory. Um, so they send the parties to mediation. All you need is for either of them to say they feel uncomfortable in a room with the other one, or there's a history of domestic violence, or they have a restraining order, or they call the police. They just have to say the magic words, domestic violence, and they'll be seen separately, put in a separate waiting room, all that kind of stuff. It takes longer, but they will. the mediator will meet with one, and then with the other, and then back and forth. And generally, we do say to our clients, this is an opportunity for you to help structure and create the visitation plan for your children. So it's not a weak thing to make an agreement at mediation on the country. We think it's a really good idea because otherwise the judge is going to make these decisions and the judge does not really care which day is football and which day is ballet. They're just going to make the orders because they've got 30 other cases on their calendar. Yes? Um, so occasionally we see a restraining order where it's not a stay away. There's no 100 yards, mm -hmm. no one yard. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not nice. to harass, molest. Mm -hmm. What, what is the standard 
that convinces a judge to do that as opposed to also having the stay away. We call those be nice orders. Um, and generally it happens when they live in close proximity to each other. So it may be that they live in the same apartment unit block or they work in the same place. I've had clients over the years where they both worked at Target, both worked at Costco, both worked for Boeing, both worked for the school district. Um, people who work together end up in relationships and those relationships go sour and then they might need a restraining order and now what are we going to do? So from the employer's perspective, the employer needs to make a reasonable accommodation. A lot of times that looks like the victim being moved to another location. And the reason for that is because the perpetrator knows everybody at this location and knows how to get through the back door and all those kind of things. So for example, when I had two minutes, when I had parties who both worked at Target or Costco, it was our client who got a job in a different, a different uh, facility, and then we were able to have a hundred yards stay away order from that. Um, if they're in the same building, does, is there only one laundry room? Do they have to walk past one person's front door to get to the other front door? Those are the kind of cases where we see a five-year-old stay away or something like that. Um, we have two more minutes, so I'm just curious like, if there's some pressing issue that I haven't addressed, something that you wanted answered that I haven't answered. Um, I actually yes. am curious if you see or suspect some of the people coming in for restraining orders are taking advantage of some of the um, immigration advantages. That's one of our favorite defenses when we have mm -hmm. perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something you've seen? I mean, I can only say that people get savvy and they try stuff, but the majority of cases we see, they really need protection. They just really do. I mean, people are so horrendous to each other. Um, and a lot of cases, they may, be, they may not even know about that advantage at the time. So we've done, uh, I've seen a lot of clients where I've helped them with the family law stuff years ago. And then like a neighbor tells them something and they realize that they may be eligible and they call me up. So can I say definitively that no one's taking advantage of it? Of course not. Um, but most of the people who are willing to sit and wait all day in a free domestic violence clinic are there because they really need protection. Yes? Are your staff, are they trained to determine, one, if there's an open uh, DCFS case, dependency case, and two, are they trained to determine credibility issues or uh, with, the, uh, with the people you're working with? I worked for LAFLA intern there about eight years ago and I know that they didn't train me to do that and I feel like probably I help people get restraining orders that didn't deserve them. Okay, um, well, like I said before, on the restraining order, on the DV100, you have to say if there's any prior cases. Mm -hmm. And one of the first questions we're gonna ask, have you ever been to a court? Have you ever been in front of a person in a black robe? Like, you know, can you, have you ever filed any paperwork? Has anybody ever served you any paperwork? We want to know. We have to know if there's another case. Um, we can't actually look it up, of course. So if they don't know or they don't tell us, we're kind of stuck with that. Um, back to the previous question, are there people who take advantage? Yes. Are we trained for credibility issues? I mean, I don't know, let's ask Brianna. <laughs> did we, I mean, we did client interviewing. We, I mean, we do so much client interviewing, you kind of start to get a sense. Do we turn people down? Absolutely. Yeah. Do we tell people, I don't think you have grounds, or even if you do have grounds, you don't have the evidence for it, and the judge isn't going to believe you? Absolutely. Whether we have a specific training on, on credibility? Tr not a specific training, but I definitely feel like there are times where I also just like felt the person was incredible or something and would check with you yeah. or whoever. Yeah, was. yeah. I mean, we check with each other all the time. We have our own little alarm bells. Um, generally, we try to avoid anything where there are sexual assault allegations of children and absolutely zero evidence of anything happening because the family court judge is going to be of the perspective that if the social workers don't think anything happened and the police didn't do anything and there's no children's court case, what am I dealing with it for? And those are very poor cases to go forward on. If there is sufficient evidence, it's going to be with you. And if there's insufficient evidence, the judge doesn't want to hear it. We've got one more question at the back, and then I think I, we do I, have time. I can, I can ask you for it. Okay. Um, I feel like the slideshow was kind of all over the place, but hopefully I did answer many of your pressing questions. Um, you do have my contact information, and you are welcome to contact me anytime. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you.